Hello everyone, welcome again. In this lecture, we will continue with the corporation tax. Now we will look at uh, uh, trading losses for corporation tax and some other other losses as well, uh, like uh, you know capital losses. All right, so I will uh, quickly uh, share the screen with you uh, so that we can uh, read through the notes together. If you could please come to page number 85 of your lecture notes. And uh, let me see, yep, 85 of your lecture notes, please. Uh, it is a corporation tax trading losses, as you can see on your screen. Now, in this uh, table, which I've just made on, uh, which I've made on the notes, uh, we will assume that our current tax year is 2013. All right. So, if our current tax year is uh, 2013, and uh, that is the year of loss, so what would happen that year? So, first thing, always, like in trading losses for individuals, we used to do that. First, we will set off against our current year's profit. Then we will think about other th uh, other years. Say, for example, carry forward or the previous years. So here as well, uh, current year, which is uh, 2013, as you can see on your screen. Uh, so we have trading loss in this year, uh, and we'll have uh, interest income, other income. We could have foreign income, property income, and capital gains as well. After that, we'll deduct the cap uh, qualifying donations. So if you have any donations given, uh, we'll have to deduct that one out of that. And uh, net amount is going to be uh, taxable total profits. So if we have trading losses, uh, first we have to deduct it uh, against our current year's losses, right? So, uh, sorry, current year's profits. So first we will deduct it uh, again, we will set off against the current year's profit. And please remember when we are setting off the uh, yeah, losses against the profits, our qualifying donations may be wasted. So when I say may be wasted, qualifying donations work in the same way like personal allowance for individuals. You remember when we are deducting the losses, sometimes our personal allowance is wasted. But what we, what we used to uh, do, we try to not waste the personal allowance so that we can take the benefit of personal allowance as well because personal allowance reduces our uh, taxable you know taxable amount taxable income because personal allowance reduce our taxable income so we pay less tax in the same way qualifying donations work so if we have qualifying donations that will reduce our taxable total profits so we will pay less tax because it's because we will have less profits however while setting off the losses uh, we might waste our qualifying donations but our, we will try to not waste the qualifying donations or you uh, waste the least qualifying donations that would be our preference uh, anyway so if we have any other loss still remains after setting off our uh, against our current year's losses uh, sorry current against our current year's profit if there is any still any loss still remains uh, then we will take it forward we'll carry it forward to the next year until all the loss is relieved so we'll set off against the 2014 and if there is still any anything left uh, in the losses then we'll carry it forward to 2014 and so on and so on until all of the losses uh, all of the losses is, are uh, relieved right so just beneath that it says uh, a note trading losses not relieved in the country can be carried forward to set off against first available trading profit of the future years right after that trading losses can be carried forward for as many years until the loss is fully relieved Qualifying donations not relieved in the year uh, will be wasted uh, in the same way like uh, personal allowance is wasted. Uh, only one difference is that uh, our uh, trading losses in the current year can be set off against all of the incomes. Whereas uh, in, in the future years we will set it off against the, uh, against the trading profits only. Right? Now if you could please come to page number Next, which is page number 86, trading losses against total income. Now, I've already told you that uh, when we have any trading losses, uh, first thing is to do, we will set it off against our current year's income, not only trading profit, but current year's total income. So that's what it says we'll have to do is, uh, if we have a trading loss, say for example, again in here as well, our current year is 2013, we have made an assumption, so if we have any trading loss, first we will set off the trading loss against our current year's total income. Uh, total income means all of the incomes which are listed here. 
So first, we will set off against the uh, trading losses. As uh, trading losses will be set off against our uh, continuous income, and then you know we'll carry it back uh, in the previous year, previous 12 months as well. And in the previous 12 months, we will uh, also do the same thing. We'll set it off against the total income. So in the notes, it says. Uh, Trading losses can be set off against total income before gift aid donations. So gift aid donations may be wasted. Of the current year, if the company wishes, it can carry uh, further carry uh, carry back its uh, trading losses. In the previous 12 months, any trading loss not relieved in the current year or the previous year then can be carried forward to the uh, future years. Right. So first thing is to do against current year. If there is anything left against the previous year, because we have broad range of options here in the current year and the previous year. However, we are limited if we carry it forward to the future year. We are only limited to the trading profits. We can only set it off against the trading profits. So we will uh, take it forward in the future years to set off against the trading profits of the future years. The claim for the loss relief should be made within two years uh, from the end of the accounting period in which the loss uh, occurred. So if it is Current year, so we'll have two years. You must you must claim it. The terminal loss relief, terminal loss relief. You know what terminal loss relief was in income tax. It is exactly the same thing here as well. So terminal loss is the loss of the last twelve months of the loss of, uh, loss of the last twelve months uh, of the trade. So it says if the trade ceases, then the trading loss of the last twelve months of the trade can be carried uh, carried back to set off against the total income of the previous thirty six months on life basis. So it is exactly the same way like we did, uh, uh, like we did for our uh, income tax. Qualifying donations will be wasted if uh, we haven't relieved them in the current tax year. Right on page number eighty-seven, it says relief for deficit on non-trade loan relationship. Now you know what non-trade loan relationship is. I've already explained in one of the previous videos. A, a non-trade loan relationship is if I have taken a loan and I have, I've used that loan for non-trade purposes and I'm paying interest on that, right? Now that will be deducted out of the interest income, right? Now when it will be deducted out of the interest income, so interest could be higher than interest income. Interest paid could be higher than interest income, which means that it will be a deficit instead of profit, right? So if interest paid is higher than interest received, so it will be a negative amount, it will be a loss, it will be a deficit. So that's what it says here. A non-trade loan deficit may be set off against any profit of the same accounting period. So we can set off against any profit, uh, uh, you know, whichever you want. Any unrelieved uh, non-trade uh, deficit can be carried forward <coughs> to set off against any future non-trade profits uh, if you want to. So you can carry it forward uh, in the future years. However, in current year, we can do for whichever profit we, we want, we can set it off against that profit in the future only against a uh, non-trade profits. Uh, this is uh, other losses. Capital losses can only be set off against the uh, same or the future accounting period and property losses. Uh, in, in, for, for the property losses, please read it carefully for the property losses. Property losses are first set off against any other income and gain for current year. So if you have any property loss, we can set off against any other income uh, and uh, gains for our current tax year. And any losses unrelieved are carried forward to set off against uh, income for the future years. All right. So it was little different. So it uh, can be set off property income can uh, property losses can be set off against any other income in the current tax year and the gains. And uh, if any losses unrelieved can be carried forward to set off against any income of the future years. Right, so we can uh, set off the losses as much as we want. However, there is uh, some there are some restrictions to set off the loss, especially when there is an uh, there is a change in the ownership uh, of the company. Right, when the ownership has been changed and there has been major changes within the company, the way we trade, if we have expanded and stuff like that, then there there will be uh, limitations on the loss, uh, uh, limitations on the setting of the loss. So if we have if you know restrictions applied, then what would happen is uh, the after the ownership, uh, the loss if we if incurred after the ownership uh, change, if the loss has incurred after the ownership change, then that loss cannot be set off the period before the previous ownership, right? So 
and the uh, other way around. So if the period, uh, if the ownership was changed on 30th of June, then the loss before 30th of June cannot be set off against the profits of the uh, post 30th June and the other way around. So the losses of the post 30th June cannot be set off against the profits of the uh, you know, pre 30th June. However, when will the restrictions apply? It says a carry forward loss relief is only available uh, against the profits arising from the same trade in which the loss occurred. Uh, trading losses may be uh, restricted uh, where there is a change in ownership of the company and there is either change in nature of the trade within the three years before and three years after the change in ownership. So there are a six year span period, three years before and three years after. Or after the change of ownership, there is considerable revival of companies' trading activities. So if there is a change in ownership and any of these two things are happening, then a restriction will apply. And if a restriction applies, any losses before change cannot be carried forward after the date of change, similarly other way around. So choices of losses, uh, choices of loss relief, it is exactly the same way like we you know, studied in uh, income tax and uh, loss relief. So earlier loss is better than the later because we don't know about any, and we don't know anything about future. And an attempt should be made to waste least gift aid donations because gift aid donations are very good for us. They reduce our profits, so we will have to pay less tax for taxable purposes. So we'll try to waste very less amount of uh, uh, gift aid donations. On page number uh, 88, uh, if you move to page number 88, please, it says, uh, you know, losses against the groups. Now, when a company is too big, they are, it is a group of companies. There are too many, group, uh, too many companies within the group. Now, them uh, companies within the group can set off the losses against each other. Now, which company will be classified within the group is a certain criteria. The group relief provision enables companies within a 75% group, uh, sorry, 75% group, uh, to transfer trading losses to other companies within the group. In order to uh, set these uh, against taxable profits and reduce group's overall corporation tax within a 75% group, surrendering company uh, can specify any amount an amount of uh, current period losses, excess property losses, excess non-trade loan relationship deficit, and excess qualifying donations to be surrendered between uh, UK companies. Now there are a few things here. It says within a 75% group, so uh, it must be uh, a 75% owned companies, uh, but there are some other conditions as well within that. I will tell you a minute. Uh, another thing is a surrendering company. There will be two things here. One is claimant company, another one is a surrendering company. Now, surrendering company is a company which made the loss. Claimant company is a company which is claiming the loss. So they have the profit and they are, uh, you know, claiming the loss. Uh, and uh, another thing is that, uh, please note down here. First, when it says specify an amount of current period trading losses. So this is current period trading losses. Then it says excess property business losses. Now, excess property business losses are, uh, you know, excess over the profits. So, if you have property property profits, and then we'll set off the set it off against the property losses, then anything left out of that that is called excess property losses. So, if you have any excess property losses, excess non-trade loan relationship deficit, and excess qualifying donations uh, to be surrendered between uh, UK companies. Uh, capital losses cannot be sur uh, surrendered for group relief. We'll have to see later. Uh, there, there are certain rules on that. Claimant company can claim group relief against uh, total taxable profits after using its own relief. We know that thing anyway. And then it says the surrendered losses under group relief uh, can be only surrendered against the profit of the corresponding accounting period. And uh, only current period losses are available for group relief. And another thing as well, uh, losses can only be set off against the UK companies, so we won't be able to set it off against any overseas companies. So losses can be surrendered to or from uh, uh, losses cannot be surrendered to or from uh, non-UK resident companies. Right now, another thing uh, about the companies: consortium relief or consortium relief. Right. So what is consortium? Consortium is a company which is owned by other companies. Now when it is owned by other companies, 
75% minimum uh, should be owned by other companies. Now when other companies own that company, uh, all of them other companies should own, uh, I mean each of the other companies should own yeah, at least 5% and not more than 75%, alright? Because we know when, when a single company owns 75%, it will be a you know, subsidiary of that company anyway, so it will be within the group, it won't be a consortium anyway, right? So, as it says in the notes, a company is owned by a consortium, also known as consortium owned company. Now, this company will be called consortium owned company, and the companies which own this company, the companies which own this company, <coughs> excuse me, called, are called consortium members. So, if 75% or more of its ordinary share capital uh, is owned by companies, consortium members, none of which hold uh, less than 5%. A consortium owned company, now it says less than uh, 5% and please make sure if you want to write down, you can write down uh, not more than you know 75% or 75%. Because if it is 75%, we know that it, it will be a group company anyway, because we have just studied that there will be a 75% uh, group relief. So if uh, if a company owns 75% in other company, that will be a, called a group. Right, so minimum is 5% and it should be less than 75% per company. But in total, it should be 75% for all of these companies. Now it says it should um, ownership must be 75% for all of the companies. So the other 25% may be owned by individuals or it could be owned by the companies as well but what does it say is that minimum 75 percent of this company must be owned by other companies not individuals right then a consortium owned company can surrender losses in proportion to stake of the members uh, of the consortium so if the consortium company makes a loss that loss can be set off against the consortium members uh, consortium members profits now how much it will be set off the percentage of the consortium members in this company so according to that percentage the losses will be relieved right so consortium relief can also uh, flow downwards a consortium member may surrender its losses to set off against uh, share its share of the consortium owned company's profits so a mem member with 25 percent stake in consortium owned company can surrender losses to cover up up to 25% uh, of the company's profit so it can work other way around as well and uh, again it says uh, losses cannot be surrendered to or from uh, you know non UK companies uh, I will just show you a question uh, on that in a minute give me one second while we finish this last page of the a corporation tax then we'll uh, look at the question Right, so on the next page, please, page number 89, uh, capital gains group. Now, for capital gains tax, uh, for other tax, I mean, for other uh, corporation tax, uh, trading profits, it is called 75% group. For capital gains tax, it is little different. So, we are now studying capital gains uh, group. Companies in the, uh, within the uh, uh, capital gains uh, companies are within the capital gains group if at each level there is a 75 percent holding and a top company must have uh, over 50 percent in group companies now you know when we made the group we, there will be top company which will be parent right then there will be subsidiaries and sub subsidiaries and all that right so there, there will be different things because there will be different subsidiaries now, uh, at each level, it says, at each level there will be 75% holding, there must be 75% holding at, e at each level, and the top company must own 50% uh, 50, uh, 50 or more than that. A top company has an effective interest of over 50% in the group companies, so only then it will be called a capital gains group. Now, what would happen, what is the benefit of this capital gains group? Now, it tells you, uh, reliefs available to capital gains group. Intra-group transfers, uh, companies within the CGT uh, group make intra-group transfers of uh, chargeable assets without any uh, capital gains tax. So it will be uh, no gain, no pain, so there won't be any capital gains tax. Then it says uh, matching group gains and losses. Give me one second. So companies within a capital gains group can transfer capital gains and losses to each other 
so you know they can set off against each other because they are within the group so that's why we're making the group that is another benefit as well so one benefit was that uh, within the group there won't be any uh, you know capital you know there won't be they, they won't be charging any capital gains tax within the companies uh, the intro group transfers will be without any capital gains tax and another benefit is that losses can be relieved against other companies within the capital gains group and uh, then in part c it says uh, rollover relief you remember what was the rollover relief for individuals any idea uh, when we in when we sell an asset and all of the proceeds of that asset are reinvested in another asset then whole of the gain can be rolled over that was called a rollover relief now within a, a cgt group if one company sells an asset and another company buys an asset then that as that these two assets can be uh, you know uh, can be called a same thing uh, for uh, rollover relief purposes right so if one company sells an asset and uh, all uh, the all of the proceeds are not reinvested by this company whereas the same amount is you know reinvested in same kind of asset by another company then it will be they can claim the rollover relief for that if a company in a capital gain group uh, sorry rollover relief a rollover relief is uh, available in a capital gains group if a member of the capital gains group disposes of an asset eligible for capital gains uh, rollover relief it may treat all of the com group companies as a single unit that's what I'm saying all of the group are the single unit so if one company sells an asset this company does not reinvest whereas the other company reinvest <clears throat> because the other company had to buy the sh uh, buy the same kind of asset anyway so that uh, you know it will be considered as single unit the group will be considered as single unit for rollover relief purposes <clears throat> treat all of the group companies as single unit for the purposes of claiming such relief acquisition by other group members within the qualifying period of one year before and three years after uh, may be matched with the disposal of other group company right now after that it says uh, a regrouping charge now intra-group transfers as we have studied earlier uh, on the same page intra-group transfers are without any capital gains tax so no capital gains tax if we uh, are within the capital gains group so one company can transfer to other company without any charging any capital gains tax there won't be any capital gains tax on that however there will be something called degrouping charge now if one asset was transferred to another company within the capital gains group so if asset was transferred there won't be any capital gains tax however after transferring that asset uh, that company left the group now if that company left the group then there will be something called a uh, degrouping charge now degrouping charge who would pay degrouping charge the company who sold the asset uh, sorry the company who sold the departing company will have to pay a uh, degrouping charge so most obviously it will be the parent company who will be selling the companies who will be selling their subsidiaries so the parent company mostly in most cases will be responsible for their degrouping charge so if a company in the capital gains group leaves the group while it owns assets transferred to it by another group member within the previous six years then the degrouping charge arises the gain or loss will be calculated using market value when it was transferred the degrouping charge is paid by the company who sold the asset and so it sold the company so after that it says uh, annual investment allowance for the companies so within the group companies uh, if you know the, the, for the uh, as we have seen earlier for a uh, degrouping charge that the group will be considered as single unit so the group will be uh, will have only one annual investment allowance so whichever way they want to use it they can use it however they will have only one annual investment allowance so that's what it says in the notes a group of companies where there is a direct or indirect shareholding relationship of 50 percent or more and the only thing is that the percentage is 50 percent here so there will be different for all of these and so it was 75 percent for normal corporation tax purposes trading profits uh, it was different for capital gains and because it was 75 percent at each level and at um, over 50 uh, over 50 percent Mm, by the parent company however for annual investment allowance it is 50 percent or more than that so there will be a, only one annual investment allowance between the group companies companies may allocate whichever way they may choose 
So that's it. Our uh, corporation tax is finished. We'll just do a question now. Right then. If you could please come to page number 274 of PPP exam kit. A uh, question name is uh, Cinebar Limited. Uh, it was examined in one of the previous exams. And uh, question number is 3 and it is second mock of the BPP exam kit. Remember I told you at the end of the BPP exam kit after the answers uh, to the questions there are a few mocks given to you. If you could go to second mock and it is question number three of the second mock and question name is Cinebar Limited. Uh, we'll only do one of the requirements of this question. If you could, uh, if you could uh, please come to requirement number C please. It says explain the supporting calculation the extent to which Cinebar Limited can claim relief for B limited trading loss under the uh, under each of the proposed uh, alternative capital structures. Now Cinebar Limited is a claimant company, and uh, so Cinebar Limited want to claim loss relief uh, for uh, you know B limited trading losses. So B limited is going to be uh, you know the loss making company, surrendering company, or you can say. So let's read the scenario. Uh, from here, Cinebar Limited is a UK resident trading company and uh, has one wholly owned UK uh, subsidiary of L Limited uh, and is a small enterprise for R&D expenditure. Prepare accounts to 31st March each year. And then it says expect to pay corporation tax by installment for all relevant accounting periods. Now this information is relevant because it says it expect to pay corporation tax by installments. Now could you please tell me that which companies pay corporation tax by installment? Which companies? Large companies, if you remember, large companies can pay a uh, corporation tax by installment. And which company is a large company uh, with a you know takings of over 1.5 million, if you remember, right? Now this 1.5 million will be divided by any number of subsidiaries if they have. Say for example, if this company has got one subsidiary of L Limited, so this limit of 1.5 million will be divided by two, so 750,000 pounds. So in order for this company to pay to be eligible to pay by installment. Our taking this company's taking must be over 1.5 uh, sorry 750,000 pounds right so intend to uh, enter uh, into a joint venture with another company uh, UK company uh, Amber Limited uh, this joint venture will be undertaken by a newly incorporated company B Limited so they are making a new company and uh, they are trading on uh, the, so the joint venture will be on this company this company, B Limited, will be incorporated in the UK and will commence trading on 1st of January 2018. And they are making their accounts to 31st of December 2018. However, they have incurred 80,000 loss in the first accounting period. Now, please remember, this company, B Limited, uh, own uh, sorry, B Limited has incurred a loss of 80,000 pounds, and it is making accounts from 1st of January to 31st of December. This company is making accounts to 31st of December, whereas Cinebar Limited. Uh, is making accounts to 31st of March. So there are different accounting dates. Please remember whenever you see the different accounting dates, so we'll have to see only the, because we will have to, uh, and we are setting up the loss as well. So we will have to take the uh, relevant, accounting, uh, relevant accounting months because that company, a uh, claimant company, is making accounts to 31st of March, whereas this surrendering company is making accounts to 31st of December 20, uh, whatever, 2018. So from our current tax year, from the 1st of January 2018 to 31st of March 2018, we will only be able to claim uh, for three months only because the other company, Cinebar Limited, is making accounts to 31st of March, right? So this year, we only do for three months. Next year, uh, we will do for remaining nine months, whatever they are, right? So it is uh, anticipated to generate trading loss of 80,000 pounds because I already studied it anyway. Then it says uh, we'll have no other source of income, uh, uh, you know, other than this uh, trading income. Now alternative capital structures are given. So according to that, we will set up the losses. Structure one is 76% shares of this B Limited is held by Amber Limited with the remaining 25% uh, uh, held by Cinebar Limited. Now, in the requirement section, it only asked about the Cinebar Limited, right? So we only need to deal with the Cinebar Limited. In, uh, in st structure number one, 76% uh, is owned by Amber Limited. We know when it is owned by more than 75%, so it is a group company, 
so there won't be any anything to do with the uh, anything to do with the Cinnabar Limited because it is a group company of Amber Limited. So all of the losses can be set off against that group. None of the losses can be you know set off against the 25% uh, shareholding because 25% shareholding is nothing when the other company owns 76%. So it is within the group of that Amber Limited. So in this structure, uh, all of the losses can be set off against Amber Limited, uh, Amber Limited's group. None of the losses can be you know set off against the Cinnabar Limited. Now the structure number two, it says 70% of the share, uh, shares will be held by Amber Limited, which is a company, 70% shares will be held by Amber Limited, 24% uh, by Cin Cinnabar Limited. Now see here, 70% by one company, Amber Limited, 24% by another company, Cinnabar Limited. So altogether, 94%, right? Now this 94% is more than 75%. Remember, consortium company, consortium company is a company in which uh, more than 75% shareholding is of other companies. So in this company is now a consortium company uh, if we go by structure number two. So uh, B Limited is now a consortium company and Amber Limited and Cinnabar Limited are uh, you know consortium, consortium members. So 25, uh, 24% by Cinnabar Limited and the remaining 6% is held by Mr. Ware is the managing director of Amber Limited. So under this structure, it is a consortium-owned company, and these two companies are, uh, you know, consortium members. We only have to deal with uh, Cinnabar Limited anyway. So whatever the loss are, uh, let's see how much is the loss. It was eighty thousand pounds, wasn't it? Yeah, eighty thousand pounds. So eighty thousand pounds is the loss we can only take off the percentage what the Cinnabar Limited has in that company. So they got 24% uh, in that company. So we'll take the 80,000 pounds multiplied by 24%. That is the amount of loss which can we, uh, which can be set off against Cinnabar Limited's profit uh, according to the shareholding in that company, right? So whatever it is, uh, 80,000 pounds into 24%. Give me one second, let's see. It is 19,200, right? So that is the loss, 19,200, that can be set off against Cinnabar Limited, uh, similar, uh, Cinnabar Limited's profit, right? Now this is the profit, uh, this is the loss of the whole year. We can only set off three uh, months worth of loss this month, this year, and the remaining nine months will be done in the next year. Only reason is because of the difference between the accounting date end. Uh, accounting date end, uh, is ending for Cinnabar Limited on 31st of March and accounting date is ending on 31st of December for uh, B Limited. So that's why we'll only have to take with the, we only have to go with the Cinnabar Limited because that is the, you know, company who owns in that B Limited, right? So whatever the loss is, 19,000, uh, whatever it was, let me do it again, I forgot, 80,000 pounds into 24%. 19,200, right? So that is 19,200 multiplied by 3 over 12, 4,800 pounds. Now this is the loss that can be set off for three months profit of Cinnabar Limited, 4,800 pounds. Now think about it, what if the three months worth of profit of Cinnabar Limited is less than this loss? What would happen then? Please remember that this loss can only reduce the profit to zero. It cannot go into negative as we have seen earlier for trading profits in the individual section as well, right? So we have seen that the loss which, can we, which we can set off against Cinnabar Limited three months is 4,800 pounds. But what if the profit of Cinnabar Limited is less than this 4,800 pounds loss, then whatever the, you know, profit is in that company for three months, we only have to, uh, you know, set off this loss for them periods and the other loss will be wasted, right? And uh, for next year, we do for nine months. So uh, what, uh, 19,200, I think it was, 19,200 multiplied by nine over 12 in next year, because we'll do remaining nine months next year. So it is 14,400 again in next year as well. Again, what we do is we'll t see how much is the profit of nine months next year for Cinnabar Limited. If the profit is less than this loss, then that profit can only be reduced to nil. This you know, loss cannot go into negative, right? So, uh, you know, it was all, uh, I think, in this question, there is nothing else. So explain the supporting calculation, the extent to which Cinnabar Limited can claim relief for B Limited's trading loss 
under each of the proposed alternative capital structures. So you have to do for both of them, uh, you know, capital structure number one and capital structure number two. There are eight marks given to us in this section. For capital structure one, it will be just one mark or one and a half mark, you can say. Uh, rest of the marks are for capital structure two. And you'll have to state everything which I have told you. And please remember, in P6, you don't have to just present the calculations. You have to do the calculations and you have to write the stuff. So you will be doing the calculations, although I will be doing the calculations. But I will be writing that. I will be uh, doing commentary on that calculation. Right? So that is the way to do uh, with uh, deal with the questions in P6. Uh, although we have only done part C in this, uh, in this question, but I want you to do all of this question because the rest of the stuff we have already covered, uh, almost everything in here. Uh, so in part one it says explain the supporting calculation treatment of corporation tax uh, for corporation tax purpose of the items included in the syllabus limited research and development expenditure then it says corporation tax implications on the uh, sale of intangible assets and then it says uh, after tax proceeds so there are some uh, capital gains tax implications right so all of these things are very very easy we've already covered them anyway uh, please make sure you do this question and the answers are given after that anyway <clears throat> Excuse me, so you can always check the answers. If you still have any problem, if you still have any questions, you can always drop a question on YouTube uh, if you have subscribed to our YouTube channel or, uh, you know, you know, a Facebook page or wherever. Right, so that's it for our this lecture and uh, good news is that we have finished our corporation tax as well. Right, so only one thing is left which is a value added tax, uh, which I will see you in the next video and then we will start. And before uh, you know, I finish this lecture, I want you to please read the value added tax, excluding uh, you know, some pages. Let me see which pages are these, which I don't want you to read because uh, they are the ones which you will not understand. Uh, page number 94, if, uh, just leave the page number 94 and 95, please and uh, uh, read all of the other pages uh, in the value tax section so just leave page number 94 and 95 because the rest of the stuff is very very easy and we have <coughs> excuse me we have covered it in our f6 studies anyway so even if you haven't studied f6 this is just a basic information we will go through together anyway but i want you to read it first so that when we move to uh, value to tax in you know next couple of days then you know what I'm talking about if you do not read it then you know you will want you won't understand what I'm talking about because I will be going through quickly uh, they are just basic things right so that's it uh, and I will see you in the next video with value to tax thank you very much and goodbye